Shelley's To a Skylark was the first real poem I ever encountered. It's strange to go to school from the age of five to the age of 14 and never encourage and never actually encounter a real poem. When I was a teacher for three or four years, between 1964, 1967, 68, I was teaching 10 year olds, a stream 10 year olds, I admit, but 10 year olds nonetheless. And I taught poetry more or less all the time, very little else. And um, I introduced children not just to the obvious poets that children would respond to, well, I don't really know retrospectively what would they be considered to be, perhaps Edmund Blunden, perhaps John Macefield, very, very minor poets, even though one was a poet laureate. He even had the chair of poetry at Oxford. But um, I introduced children to the poets who had taught me. I mean, really physically taught me in the actual world. Poets like Martin Bell, John Silkin, Peter Redgrove, David Wright, all who were Gregor Fellows in poetry at Leeds University. And I introduced them to Ginsburg, to Howell, to James Kirkup, who was then well known but now he's forgotten, he's my personal mentor by letter from Japan, and um, we virtually spent the entire day reading, writing poetry, painting, to music, uncovering the unconscious, fire art therapy. I didn't know such a thing existed at the time. Listening to folk music, John Byers, classical music, trying to teach, trying to learn dance, and my beginnings as a psychoanalyst, though never qualified, began at that time. And I now look back to my own education as a poet. And at 14, at a dreadful grammar school, we read a dreadful anthology called The Way Opens. I think about 150 pages. There was only one decent poem, which was Shelley's To a Skylark. And I learned every one of its, I think, 14 stanzas by heart, something. I certainly couldn't do now. Leavis deprecated the influence of, of Shelley and read a poem of his with great passion, which moved his students, and then he continued to demolish the poet. But what the, the students remembered was a marvellous rendition of the poem. And I still think that for me personally, Shelley is the romantic poet who influenced me the most. Byron, I could never see the reason for him to be considered a great poet. Keats, I recognise, is great, but doesn't somehow speak on my wavelength. Blake, to me, was a greater painter and graphic artist than was a poet. And, and to me, the epitome of romantic poetry is Shelley. Wordsworth is a poet I did at one time greatly admire, but somehow, as I've got older, his influence has faded. And looking at to a skylark, I do see why it is so effective. The skylark is a metaphor for a number of things. muse and the kind of sense of identification, empathic identification, we call it psychoanalysis, with an animal. Of course Ted Hughes, probably no admirer of Shelley, 
achieve this again in his animal poems. When you think of Lupercal and his poem about a hawk. But the hawk represents, and did for Hughes, nature read in tooth and claw, which is a very much a Darwinian view. But of course when Shelley was writing, Darwin was someone to come in the future. Yet there are things in Shelley, not that in any way um, were prolegomena to Darwin, but certainly were taken up by poets in France such as Mallarmé. Mallarmé was obsessed with the sky which he always referred to as Le Bleu, the blue. And, and uh, I think the sky like is the most symbolically intense romantic poem of all the romantic movement. Hail to thee, blithe spirit. Bird, thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated arts. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest, like a cloud of fire the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar and soaring ever singest. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, O'er which the clouds are brightening, Thou dost float and run Like an unbodied joy, Whose race is just begun. The pale purple even melts around thy, thy flight, Like a star of heaven in the broad daylight. Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. Keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere, whose intense lamp narrows in the white dawn clear, until we hardly see, we feel that it is there. All the earth and air, with thy voice is loud, as when night is bare from one lonely cloud, the moon rains out her beams, and heaven is overflowed. What thou art we know not, what is most like thee, from rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see, as from thy presence showers a rain of melody. Like a poet hidden in the light of thought, singing hymns unbidden, till the world is wrought to sympathy with hopes and fears it heeded not. Like a high-born maiden in a palace tower, soothing her love-laden soul in secret hour, with music sweet as love which overflows her bower. Like a glow-worm golden in a dell of dew, Scattering unbeholden in its aerial hue, Among the flowers and grass which screens it from the view, Like a rose embowered in its own green leaves, By warm winds deflowered till the scent it gives, Makes faint with too much sweet those heavy winged thieves. Sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass, Rain awakened flowers all that ever was, Joyous and clear and fresh, Thy music doth surpass. Teach us, sprite or bird, What sweet thoughts are thine, I have never heard praise of love or wine, That panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. Chorus hymeneal, or triumphal chant, Matched with thine would be all but an empty vaunt, a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. What objects are the fountain of thy happy strain? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind? What ignorance of pain? With thy clear keen joyance, longer cannot be. Shadow of annoyance never came near thee, thou lovest. 
but ne'er knew love's sad satiety. Waking or asleep, thou of death must, must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream, or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream? We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, if we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. Better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then as I am listening.